It does not cost you anything to have an opinion. Your opinion is free. It does not cost you anything to have your opinion. However, opinions can be costly. Not all opinions are based on truth. In fact, most opinions have nothing to do with the truth. Which would lead us to really the most important question would be, what is truth? Or how do you determine truth? How do you go about deciding if something's true? And then how do you even define truth? I want you to use your mind's eye, use your imagination a little bit. I want you to go back a couple of thousand years. And you find yourselves on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Now in your mind, think, think a lake, think a mountain lake. Don't think beach. Because the Sea of Galilee really is a lake. And you, you decide what you are in this little village. Maybe you're the tanner. Maybe you're the horseshoe person. Maybe you're the baker. But you've gone about your life. You've been taught your religion. You've read from your scriptures. But you're starting to hear some rumors, some rumblings, that there's this guy. He says he's a rabbi, but he's saying that he's more than a rabbi. He's actually saying that he's the Messiah. And you're hearing that he's doing some pretty amazing things. And he's healing some people. He's setting some people free. But he's also saying some things that are, that are hard to hear. And then one day, he's there. He's chosen your village to spend the day in. And as soon as he's there, there's already a crowd. They've gathered. And you walk slowly up to begin to think and to begin to listen to what it is that he's saying. And you see some people there that are sick and you know why they're there because they hopefully are going to be healed. But you begin to hear this man talk. Now, you know, I'm talking about Jesus. Do you think that you would have taken his teaching at that particular point in time as the gospel? Do you think that you would have heard him and said, oh, immediately he is the Messiah? Now, I know the Sunday school answer for us is yes, of course. That's we would want to be one of the few that said, yes, this is it. How do you handle the truth? How do you look for it? How do you decide if something is true? Jesus was saying some things that were not sitting well with the people of power and with the people of prestige. And very early, very early, he is already saying some things that's causing people to say, this man must die. Who do you side with? Do you say, no, no, he's speaking the truth? Or do you say, no, he must die? Well, this is the setting that we find ourselves in Mark chapter 4. And in Mark chapter 4, Jesus begins to teach in parables. And last week, we learned that parables are just little short stories that Jesus uses. And sometimes they're self-explanatory. Most of the time, they're not. They can be kind of complicated and very mysterious. And in Mark chapter 4, starting with verse 21, he 
he shares a, a parable of what in all of my Bibles is marked as the parable of the lamp. And this is one of these parables that when you just read it, it's like, okay, that's pretty straightforward and pretty simple. Now, this is coming on the heels of him telling the parable of the sower of the seeds and where the seed has been thrown out. In Mark chapter 4, 21, it says, Then Jesus asked them, Would anyone light a lamp and then put it under a basket or under a bed? Of course not. A lamp is placed on a stand where it is light, where its light will shine. For everything that is hidden will eventually be brought into open, and every secret will be brought to light. Anyone who hears Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Then he added, pay close attention to what you hear. The closer you listen, the more understanding you will be given, and you will receive even more. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given. But for those who are not listening, even, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. Now, when you just, you just read this for its face value, you, you read that and you go, okay, a, a parable of a light, it's okay, that makes sense. And then he's just kind of adding some things to it. But really what's going on here is Jesus, is Jesus is making four statements. And in the Gospel of Mark, they're consecutive. It's one, two, three, four. Jesus makes these four statements, for instance, in the book of Matthew, in the gospel according to Matthew, these four statements are there, but they're spread out all throughout Matthew. The first statement about the lamp is in Matthew 5, which is the Sermon on the Mount. The second statement, which deals with secret, secret things, is in Matthew chapter 10. The third statement that's about what you, you'll get what you receive or you receive what you give. It's, in, it's also part of the Sermon on the Mount, but it's in chapter 7. And then the last statement is found in, in chapter 13. Jesus taught the same message wherever he went. And a lot of times we'll see something like the Sermon on the Mount and we'll go, well, Jesus, you know, this was, uh, was kind of like his famous speech. You know, it's the thing that he's known for. He gives this and he puts the flag in the ground and okay, this is it. Oh, everybody remembers the Sermon on the Mount when really what the Sermon on the Mount would have been what Jesus taught wherever he went. So Jesus was teaching the same message to different audiences. He'd go to different villages and he'd teach the same message. And, and we see this played out for us here. Mark takes the four statements, four very common statements. As you see, when you leave today, you're going to go, those are, those are four basic things that I've been taught all my life. And if you have children, four things you're trying desperately to teach your children. And in Mark, they're in consecutive order. In a book like Matthew, they're spread throughout but Jesus would teach this, and he would say these things. So let's look at, let's look at the first one. It's, it's the parable of the, the lamp in verse 21. It says, would anyone light a lamp and then put it under a basket or under a bed? Of course not. A lamp is placed on a stand where light will shine. Now, that's pretty self-explanatory, isn't it? It's kind of like if you're going on a night hike and you got a flashlight, you wouldn't turn your flashlight on and then put it in your backpack it your backpack. That's just not what you would do. And he's talking about a lamp and it'd been a bowl that have some wax in it with a wick and you would light it and you would, when you would do that, when it would get dark, you would put it somewhere where the light can go out. So it seems like it needs no explanation, but since I'm a pastor and a preacher, I'm going to give you some explanation. Truth is meant to be seen. Truth is meant to be seen. Well, actually, I, I, I titled this, This Little Light of Mine. Don't know that song? This Little Light of Mine? This Little Light of Mine. Y'all sing it. I will let it shine. This Little Light of Mine. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Don't let Satan blow it out. I'm going to let it shine. Don't let Satan it out. It's got, it's got hand motions. Yes, that's right. All right. So this little light of mine. So it's a pretty, it's pretty self-explanatory, but truth is meant to be seen. Truth is meant to be seen. Now, truth can be dangerous. It can lead to persecution. It can lead to pain and trouble. And then here's the really big one. Truth 
is often seen as not nice. Truth is often seen as not nice. In scripture, we're commanded to be kind. Nowhere are we commanded to be nice. We'll just do a little group participation. Everybody, I want you, everybody. How many of you have ever not told someone the truth because you didn't want to hurt their feelings? Everyone. Okay, if you didn't raise your hand, you're lazy or you're lying or both. Okay? <laughs> We've all done that. We know the truth's going to hurt. We know the truth's going to be painful. We know the truth. And so, so we withhold the truth, but the truth is not meant to be held back. The truth is not to be covered up. You don't have a light. You don't light a light and then put it under the bed. You don't light You don't turn your flashlight on, flashlight on and put it in the back of your backpack. That's not what you do. And this is what Jesus says. He says, listen, the light, the light is meant to be seen. In seminary, you're required to take a class called the Introduction to Christianity, which would be a pretty good class to take if you're in seminary, I suppose, the Introduction to Christianity. It's two semesters. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big class. Well, the first, the first three quarters of the whole first semester and half of the second semester of the Introduction to Christianity is really a history of the Roman Catholic Church. Because in the first 1,500 years or so of Christianity, it really is the history of the Roman Catholic Church. Well, the Roman Catholic Church, by the time you get to the 1500s, the Roman Catholic Church is twisted and wicked. It is so messed up. And one of the primary ways that it is messed up is a thing called indulgences. And this is where the church was selling prayers, selling forgiveness. It would be like after church today, you coming up to me and say, hey, pastor, would you please pray for me about this? And I said, well, sure, that will be $500. And if you wanted me to pay two, pray for you two or three more times this week, then, you know, I'll, I'll give you a deal. One prayer for 500, two prayer for 1,000, three prayers for 1,200. Just whatever you want to do that. Well, this, this is totally ridiculous. And so there's this, there's this priest. His name is Martin Luther. And Martin Luther realizes that this is wrong. He knows this is not the truth. And so Martin Luther writes 95 theses, 95 statements. And his goal was to reform the Catholic Church. His, his, his goal was not to do away with the Catholic Church. His, his goal was to reform the Catholic Church. And then he takes these 95 uh, statements and he nails them on the door of a church in Wittenberg. Now, that may seem odd to us, but that is exactly the way you communicated in the day. That was the front page of the newspaper. That was Twitter. That was Facebook. That was all of those things. This is what you did. If you're at the university, we're going to have a debate about a topic. They would nail it to the door. So in Wittenberg, Germany, he went to this church, the Church of All Saints. Not the Church of St. Peter, not the Church of St. Paul, not the, it's the Church of all the saints. So this is the biggest church, the most important church, the most prominent church. And so he goes to that church to nail the thesis on it. He chooses All Saints Day, which is November 1st. It's the biggest day of the year. It's the day where the most attendance will be. In fact, they have attendance is so, so big on that day, they have to add multiple services to accommodate the crowds. And on top of that, the day that he chose, the most popular church on the most popular day, was also the day was the church was celebrating its anniversary. So this is a big deal. And on this day, Martin Luther goes and nails what he believes the truth to be from Scripture. And the Protestant Reformation is born. Now there's all kinds of things Martin Luther could have done. He could have not written them. He could have just turned and said, no, it's not worth the hassle. He could have written them and only shared them with a few people. He could have written them and actually posted them on a door, but not, not the biggest church in town. He could have actually done that on the biggest church at the biggest and most prominent church in the region. But he could have done it on the least attended day, not the most attended day. 
And he didn't choose to do any of that. Because the truth is meant to be seen. Now, what is the truth? Well, the truth is Jesus. When we say Jesus is the answer, this is what we mean, because Jesus is the truth. Jesus himself says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus also says the truth will keep you in bondage. No. What will the truth do? Set you free. The truth is Jesus, and the truth is meant to be seen. So as he's talking to them, he's, listen, you don't, you don't take a light and put it under the bed. And I am the light. I'm the light of the world. I'm the Messiah. So I'm, I'm not going to hide. The other thing is our faith is meant to be seen. How you live out your faith, it's meant to be seen. We're not supposed to live out our faith in private. So how I behave and how I treat people. How I arrive in an opinion and how, listen to this, how I give my opinion should honor Jesus. Our faith is meant to be seen. See, the truth is hard. The truth is very hard. And the reason that most people will not stand in the truth, the reason that most people will hide the truth, is because most people are allergic to the truth. We're allergic to the truth. You know the scene from A Few Good Men? If you watch any movie, you watch movies, you know who the actor is. Jack Nicholson. And you know the line. What does he say? What does he tell Tom Cruise? You can't handle the truth. And Jesus is saying, I am the light of the world. And my light, my truth is not to be hidden. And the second statement is very similar. I, I call it, I got a secret. In verse 22, for everything that is hidden will eventually be brought into the open and every secret will be brought to light. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand, should listen and understand. I got a secret. Truth cannot be hidden. If something's true, it's going to be out there. Now, I can refuse to face the truth. I can try to suppress it. I can refuse to accept it. But the truth will always win. I want to go back to the, about the time of Martin Luther in the 1500s. And there's a guy named Copernicus. Now, Copernicus was an, astro uh, an astrology guy, astronomer. And Copernicus had this belief, really more than a belief. He's like, he knows this to be true, that, that the earth does not, that the sun does not rotate around the earth, but that the earth rotates around the sun. Now, which one of those do you believe? You believe... As you know, the earth rotates around the sun. The sun does not rotate around the earth. Well, in the early 1500s, that was what, the, nobody believed that. So Copernicus knew that if he came out and stated the truth, if he came, came out and stated what he believed to be the truth, that he would lose his life. They would kill him. Because you just didn't do those kind of things in those days. So he waited till he was on his deathbed when he literally had nothing else to live for. And he convinced a young scientist named Gal Galileo to produce his work. And he did. Now, Copernicus died because he was an old man. Galileo then lived his life trying to get people to believe the truth. Now, the church came after him and the powers that be that came after him. And two different times he recanted. He said, I, I've said this, I've produced this, I say it's true, but I, I, I take it back. 
It did not save him from a life in prison, but it did save his life. When he died, he was not allowed to be buried in his family's tomb because he was a disgrace. At the time, there was a very uh, popular, very well-known Roman Catholic priest who said this. He said, people give ear to an upstart astrologer, talking about Copernicus and Galileo, who believes that the sun doesn't rotate around the earth. This fool wishes to reverse the entire science of astronomy. But sacred scripture tells us that Joshua commanded the sun to stand still and not the earth. You want to know who said that? Martin Luther. Over here, he was really right. And over here, he could not be more wrong. You ever had a day like that? <laughs> you ever had a day when you were really right and then really wrong? Yeah, it's called what? Most days. <laughs> right? That's what's called daily life. Truth can't be hidden. It doesn't matter who's against it. Truth cannot be hidden. Our lives and conduct cannot be hidden either. I've got a secret. So these first two statements, very close to each other. The next two statements are going to be very close to each other as well. And, and you know how we say around here, we talk about how we want to help you know, each other live the truth of Jesus in everyday lives. Well, these four statements are helping us live the truth of Jesus in everyday life. We can't hide the truth. We need to stand up for the truth. Even when it's messy, even when it's going to cost us something, we got to make sure that we do that. And then we get to verse 3, and he says, Then he added, Pay close attention to what you hear. The closer you listen, the more understanding you will be given. And you will receive even more. So here he's saying, listen, give, give full attention. The closer you listen, the more you lean in, the more understanding you will be given. And you will receive even more. And, and I, I title this, Get What You Give. You get what you give. Pretty simple, basic philosophy of life, right? You get what you give. The more you put into something, the more you get back. It's true in work. The more you work, the more you get back. The more you study, the, the more you learn, the more learning you have, the, the, the more intelligent you get. So you, you, you get what you give. When was the last time you researched your opinion? Annie? <laughs> Five minutes ago. We should research our opinions. Shouldn't we? I mean, what would happen if we researched our opinions? That would be crazy. That would actually be crazy. It's true in worship. The more you give, the more you get back. William Barclay shares um, three ways that we worship wrong. I'm going to share them with you. One is worship is we attend to get. We come to church to get. We come to church to be entertained. We come to church to be, to get. Well, well, Pastor Marty, how do I know when I'm coming to church to get? Well, when it's all about who's singing and what songs and the chairs and the coffee or the no coffee, then you're there to get. You're not there to give. You're not there to give worship and honor to God. You're not there to give love and support to the people around you. You're there to get. The second thing we do a lot of times when we come to worship is we come with no expectations. We don't expect God to speak. We don't expect God to move. We don't expect God to show us his love. And then the third one, 
I think that we all can say that we've been guilty of many, many times in our life. We come to church with no preparation. We don't prepare for what we're going into. Pure Art Weekends are an important part of what we do here. And I look forward to the day when we can start having them again. And we're not going to have them again until the masks go away. Because you can't have a Pure Art Weekend wearing a mask. In fact, the Pure Art Weekend is about teaching you how to get rid of your mask. <laughs> so wearing a mask is kind of... But it starts on uh, Friday afternoon about 1 o'clock. And about 11, 30, 12 o'clock on Saturday. We have some prayer time and go through some prayer experiences. And it's been uh, without question, nothing's even close. The most amazing, sweetest, incredible God moments happen during that time. And people will ask me, why? Why is that? And I'm learning to say, I think it's because we spent 24 hours building up to it. We spent 24 hours together talking and sharing and open up God's word and praying. And we come in with such an expectation and our hearts and our minds have been softened to be able to receive what God has for us. But unfortunately for most of us, when we show to worship, it's what can I get with little to no expectations and no preparation. Could you imagine going on a really expensive vacation and not planning for it? How does dinner go when you don't plan for it? Peanut butter and jelly? Nothing wrong with peanut butter and jelly. I have four or five of those a week for lunch, but... Uh, that's because I didn't put a lot of prep into lunch. So it's true for work. It's true for worship. It's also true for relationships. You get what you give. You get what you give. The more you put into the relationship, the more you can get back. Well, Marty, what about the person I'm just, I'm just pouring into, pouring into, pouring into, pouring into, and I'm not getting anything back. Move on. Move on. They're not interested. And the more I give into a relationship, the more I'm going to get back. And that obviously includes my relationship with God. So there's a statement, don't hide your light. There's a statement of, listen, what's in the secret is going to be brought out. The truth is going to be known. There's the statement where he's talking about, hey, you're going to get uh, what you give. And that leads us to the last statement, the fourth one. It's this in verse 25. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given. So how do you get more understanding? Listen. Listen to what he's putting out before us. Listen. But for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. That's not my words. That's not my opinion. Those are the words of Jesus. He's saying, listen, the more you listen and the more you lean in, the more I'm going to give you. If you stop listening, I'm going to take away what you have. I've been a pastor for over 30 years, and I can't tell you how many times I've said this. It's as if this person who claims to be a Christian has never read the Bible. It says, as if this person who claims to be a Christian has never heard a sermon based on the scripture, the way they're behaving, what they're thinking, what they're saying. It's like, what in the world are, what is going on here? Well, here's what's going on here. When you don't listen and you don't lean in and you don't want it, God says, what little you have, I'm going to take away. So I titled this, The Rich Get Richer. And don't see the word rich and get all thinking about money. The 
The rich get richer. The more I give, the more I'm going to get. The more I want it, the more of, him, more of him that I want, the more he will reveal to me. The more understanding that I want, the more understanding that he will give to me. It's true in so many ways. Education, it's true. The more you study, the more you learn. It's true with effort. The more effort you give to something, the better off it's going to be. Dallas Willard says, grace is not opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. God doesn't want me to try to earn his love. God doesn't want me to try to earn his blessing. God doesn't want to try to earn my, no, but he is not opposed to my effort. The Bible's not going to speak to me if I don't sit down and open it up and read it. How's God going to speak to me if I don't take time to listen to what he has to say to me? It's true with a skill or a craft. You want to be a better guitar player? You want to be a better tennis player? You want to be a better golfer? What are you putting in? And then there's the ability to bear responsibility. The ability to bear responsibility. I'm reading a book right now. It's called Leadership Pain by Dr. Chad. And he, he says he ends every chapter the same way. And this is what he says. The amount of pain you're willing to bear will directly result the size of your platform. The amount of pain you're willing to bear directly impacts the size of your platform. Because the more that you lead, the more painful it's going to be. The more you stand for the truth, the more painful it's going to be. Because remember, people are allergic to the truth. And I think he's on to something because who has the largest platform of all? Jesus. Every knee's going to bow. <coughs> who knows the most pain of all? Jesus. Four statements. This guy shows up to your village and he starts talking about stuff you've never heard. Do you believe him? Or do you want to kill him? seems to be the two categories. The truth is hard, but the truth is the truth. And if we want to be set free, then we're going to have to get used to the truth. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for the fact that you've given us this. You've given us four statements just consecutively. We know that those exist in other places, but in other places you make us look for them a little bit harder. But here they're just laid out and they're simple. Father, we want to, we really do want to live in the truth that is you. So, Father, give us the courage when it's hard. Give us the ability to keep going when we want to quit. 
Help us to know that it's the second mile. That's where the real benefit comes. Father, help us not to be afraid of effort. Keep us away from trying to earn, but help us to run to effort, to put the work in. And Father, we claim, we claim your promises here that the more that we'll listen, the more we'll lean in, the more you'll give us. And Father, we want more of you. We want more of your love. We want to experience your love in ways we've never experienced. We want to experience your healing. We don't want to be caught up in the fear of viruses or conspiracy theories. We want to stand in the truth that is you. So help us to do that. In your name we pray. Amen.